Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of a series of podcasts by Commentary is Magic. I am, as always, Grand Paws. I am Emperor of Yugle. Big Cheese. And our cat. We are very glad to be here for this new series. Maybe. Well, some of us are. <laughs> So we've had a lot of fun doing live streams and commentary, as our name suggests, for you over the last, well, year. It has been over a year now. Woo! Yay, birthday. Wow. Hooray, we more than one year. We didn't get uh, any we need, we need the mod gif with the, uh, the little uh, party favor. Yes, I agree. And though it has been a lot of fun doing that, we know that there's been a call for more content. And so that is exactly what this is. This and other podcasts like it will give us the ability to share some tips and tricks or uh, talk about ongoing uh, changes in the metagame or the fandom and uh, get those out there a little more frequently to all of you instead of having to wait for a live stream that you might end up missing. So... Today, we're going to be starting the first of a series of podcasts talking about how to play against different archetypes. Bugle will get into that here in just a bit. But today, we're going to be focusing on how do you play against aggro. And we will be talking about how you would do this from a variety of different perspectives, using different tools, and hopefully give you all the tips and advice that you need to have better success playing against aggro decks. So... Bugle, tell us a little bit more about what we mean when we talk about a particular archetype. When I'm talking about an archetype, I'm talking about how does a deck win. This is in contrast with a deck's speed. The speeds that most people tend to refer to are aggro, mid-range, and control. But that's not what, how we're going to refer to speeds. We're going to refer to speeds as fast decks, medium decks, and slow decks. Now, the archetypes that we're going to be referring to are aggro, which is winning through confronting problems and scoring big that way or uh, through face-offs. A combo, which is winning through non-traditional methods such as pile of presence, big shot, fashion week, those kind of things. Control, which is winning via disrupting the opponent and con confronting slowly or through other forms of disruption. Finish, for example. And yeah, photo finish. And farming, which is winning via challenging and defeating troublemakers. Now, these archetypes can all have speeds. We have fast aggro decks. We have medium speed aggro decks. We have fast farming decks. We have fast aggro decks. You know, they can fall under different speeds. So that's why we're not going to say an aggro deck is intrinsically fast. An aggro deck wins through confronting problems, and winning face-offs. So speaking of which, what exactly is an aggro deck? Cheese? An aggro deck wins the game by confronting problems and winning face-offs. It's going to want to do this as often as possible. There are a few key card types that aggro uses to do this. One are aggressively costed cards. These are cards that allow you to do much better than just, you know, paying 4 AT for a big 4-power friend. Like blue, blue can do way better than that. One of the card types that do these are your 1 AT for 2 power friends. Aggro loves these cards. Another card type is that in the same vein are cards that have on interest playability. Like Aloe is a really great example of this. 1 AT, she gives another friend plus 2 power. Heck of a lot better than 1 for 1 power. So another friend that has this ability that's actually really interesting combined with the Octavia main is Spitfire Wing Leader. This gives you a 3 for 3 body with 3 tokens on top of that, which I'll give plus two power to something else with Octavia. Another card type are going to be your AT acceleration cards. These allow you to either use a friend in play or spend another card from hand to make other cards in your hand cost less. So examples of this are going to be Cloud Chaser, you know, good old staple, been, been around since Premiere, the Penny Hooves engine, Two Bits, and Wonder Ball Trap. Another type of card that Agro is going to use heavily are point acceleration cards. The, the main staples for Point Acceleration right now are Rarity Truly Outrageous and Night Glider. You're going to see these in almost every Iger deck. No, not necessarily at the same time. Yes, although sometimes you will. Iger decks, they're going to use these cards, and they're going to be fast. They're going to be your fastest decks, because that's the whole point. You're trying to outrace what anybody else can do. Finish before they even get whatever they want in, in their hand. Because of this, they're going to sacrifice their flip power a lot. And so they either have to not care about flip power if you're only relying on RTO, or you're going to have to use some things to get around that. The major thing that blue has now is competitive friends. So you've got your like three power main 
but also as plus two competitive, thus increasing your base power. Then, since you can't really rely on flips, you will have other face-off tricks. A major one still is Critter Cavalry, plus five power. Ever Vigilant is a new card from Marks in Time. Move a friend to each problem. As long as you're in a good situation, that can often give you a ton of power. Another major thing is Hasty Friends. A key example here is Prince Rutherford. He's only two power, but he's going to frighten an opponent, which, depending on who you're against, could be a, a massive hit to them. The major colors you're going to see in aggro are going to be blue, now that we have Bluna, her acceleration, and the new Scootaloo. You're often also going to see pink, just because Vinyl is such an amazing main. White, you do, will see Octavia mains, but generally white is, has been an off color. You're also going to see some yellow, either both uh, as a main with Fluttershy friend, friend to animals, or as an off color. Now that we've got an understanding of what goes into an aggro deck, let's take a look at a few examples. Ara? Okay, so a few examples. We're going to cover a handful of relatively well-known aggro decks, and then we're going to discuss very briefly what makes these decks tick. So we'll go in chronological order here, and starting at the beginning of time, we have an oldie but goodie, Rainbow Dash Wins, otherwise known as RDW, a play off of the Magic Deck, Red Deck Wins. Uh, so what makes this thing work is it's got a ton of cheap stuff in it, lots of blue and yellow. It's got movement trains to get power to problems very, very efficiently and win face-offs. This deck was extremely successful during the premier era uh, before the advent of the high flip average decks uh, the stuff that you'll see in this rainbow dash flyer extraordinaire the rainbow main of course the first one that drags a friend along with it for the low low cost of one token oh and by the way it's got swift just for that extra kick in the pants uh holly dash and wildfire both very good they'll pull something with them uh because it's running yellow and this is the premier era they are of course running guidance counselor why not and uh other fun items such as owls and falcons Moving on from the Premier Era, but staying on the theme of yellow, next up we've got Ballroom Blitz. This is an example of extreme efficiency and explosiveness. Yellow's insane power generation coupled with white getting pulled along for the ride, basically just for the RTOs. Often capable of taking a game by turn 5 and extremely consistent at doing so. The common cards that you like to see here, a Free Owl, otherwise known as May the Best Pet Win, Falcons, Owls, of course, and the, you know, RTOs. Free Owl, of course, is very interesting because this is a rather interesting contribution to the aggro design space where you choose problems such that you exactly meet the confront requirements. And Free Owl helps you do that by, well, providing you a Free Owl. Another deck of this era, uh, Pegasus, Pegasus Explosion, uh, was a different flavor of extreme efficiency with blue and pink. Uh, this tended to make a somewhat inconsistent but blazing fast aggro deck when it worked. This is distinct from Vinyl Explosion, which came slightly later. It's essentially the same thing made by Vinyl and running the Penny Hooves engine. It's faster and arguably more consistent. At the same time, we had Diamonds, which is the best part of Ballroom Blitz and Pegasus Explosion combined together into a blue-white deck that has made showings in high-level play from mid Canterlot Knights to the end of the Crystal Games meta. The RTOs are, of course, the secret sauce here, but all the blue AT acceleration and power efficiency wasn't hurting either. Here we take a rather massive jump into the mid to early High Magic meta with a deck that is occasionally called Sapphires, which is essentially Diamond readapted to run Luna Dream Warrior, Bluna. It uses a lot of the same tricks, but it has better efficiency and benefits uh, from Hasty Friends to cause double face-offs with less AT, uh, frequently featuring Night Glider overpowering to take advantage of those frequent double face-offs. Now that we've covered a few of the big names in aggro and how they ticked, Grandpa's has a few words about us about the flaws in aggro strategy. So aggro, as we've learned, can come in a variety of different flavors, but most aggro decks are going to share some of the same weaknesses, and it's these weaknesses that you're going to want to exploit in order to have a better matchup against them. First, aggro is very prone to targeted disruption. 
Most of these decks are going to have a few specific key pieces. Uh, usually these are going to be your point acceleration tools or in certain blue decks, your conga lining friends that can move something else with them. Removing these can set an aggro deck back dramatically. Now, especially more so than ever, since you don't get the problem bonus for just confronting it for the first time anymore, you really need a way to boost your point gain. In addition, aggro decks need to remain as AT efficient as possible. They hate having to waste action tokens on disruptive resources, or having to play additional friends if you remove ones that they have, or even needing to remove some of your key friends. So, for example, one of the key cards we saw that slowed down aggro in this way was Study Session, where now, all of a sudden, most aggro decks aren't in good resource removal colors, with the exception of yellow, and would need to use 2 AT with Seabreeze's Flower in order to remove it. Most aggro decks are also going to have very little disruption on their own. So, if you can land a powerful friend or some other tool that is going to greatly decrease aggro's chances of success, aggro is going to be limited in terms of how it can deal with it. Some of the best removal that aggro has access to and will typically play is going to come in the form of soft removal, like Frightening through Prince Rutherford. And these are things that can usually be undone. There's very few aggro decks that are going to waste valuable card spots in their deck for hard removal. And that's really aggro's final weakness, is aggro needs to consistently draw gas. It needs consistently powerful, impactful cards, draw after draw after draw. Every resource removal you draw when your opponent has no resources, every friend removal you draw when your opponent has no friends, those are just slowing you down. And as a result, aggro decks have very few open slots for toolbox cards in their deck list to deal with whatever's going on in the meta. There are some, but they're going to be more general, and as a result, aggro can have wildly different rates of success from one meta to the other. So knowing these weaknesses, each archetype, aggro, farming, control, and combo can utilize different strategies to leverage their own advantage against aggro decks, uh, even in the mirror matchup, for example. So, Aura, uh, how would an aggro player accomplish this? Well, in most aggro matchups, uh, unsurprisingly, this comes down to a very simple question. Are you able to go faster than your opponent? Magic players might ask a similar question, which is, who's the beatdown? Essentially, if you're getting the cards, you need to go faster than your opponent. You simply, you know, go faster than your opponent and win before they do. Aggro matches can often hinge on whether or not one player gets that one card they need to close the game. Consistency in these kinds of decks is princess. Yes, princess, not king, not queen, they're evil. Sometimes you'll end up not getting the cards that you need to go fast or finding out that your opponent is actually running a deck that's designed to go faster than yours. In these cases, the best kinds of aggro decks will typically dabble in control cards to disrupt their opponents, or perhaps a card to find some key card that can be used to accelerate their strategy. Bringing those cards in your deck and recognizing when you'll need to use them rather than go fast is often key to winning an aggro mirror. That's a quick summary of what aggro can do against other aggro. So let's look at what combo can do against aggro. Combo's main concern with aggro is, can aggro win before I can get my combo off? That's, that's pretty much your entire question. Because aggro's generally not going to have that many answers to combo in terms of hurting you during the combo. You always got to do math during combos, but this is like every single turn when their opponent passes turn, you're going to be like, can they win next turn? You got to look, what do they have on the board? What if they play two RTOs? What if they play two Night Gliders? And then you have to make... You're going to be making lots of bets. Because aggro can often get, you know, like, seven points in a single turn. And sometimes you just you don't have enough AT to go off. And so you have to make that bet. You're also going to be comparing your AT. And you need your cards to be able to go off your combo. But you may also have some cards that can slow down an opponent. And so you're going to have to say, see if it's worth it to spend those cards right now to slow them down so you can get another turn of AT gain. So that's about it for combo. What's, uh, what's control going to have to do in this case? So control. Control versus aggro. The eternal question, right? So when you're playing as control against aggro, you are going to be playing the long game. Arcat mentioned who's the beatdown. You are not the beatdown when you're playing control against aggro. You are about disruption while they are about speed. So there will typically be two phases to your plan. The first phase is setting up. Playing some key friends, troublemakers, resources that'll help you throughout the game. 
Typically, this will be stuff that will provide more benefits the longer they're in play. Stuff like your Princess Twilight, Sparkle, Cover to Cover, also known as Paper Twilight. It's things that will give you an advantage the more you can use them. Or stuff that will cause trouble for your opponent the longer they're in play, like any troublemaker. Hence the name. During this phase of the game, you're kind of okay letting aggro do their thing for a little bit, at least partially, so you can ignore them. Sometimes the, the general guideline is to let them get to approximately 6 or 7 AT, or 6 or 7 points when you're getting 4 AT a turn. And at that point, you want to enter your second phase, which is the lockdown. This is when you should be stopping them from confronting points as regularly as possible. Or if you can't stop them from confronting every single turn, at least stop them from getting the big turns. If they slam down three RTOs, that you don't want them to confront that turn. That Anything you can do to stop them, you should absolutely take. But if they're only going to get one point, you might not want to use that nap cakes until later. Depends on the situation. Unless, of course, they're at 14 points. So, there are two common methods of locking down. First are your proactive cards. This is your troublemakers, your vexing, some resources that have you know, a reoccurring events, stuff like that, or re reoccurring abilities. And these are your first lines of defense because they can typically work from turn to turn. You invest in them once, and theoretically, they'll be stopping the opponent turn after turn. And your second line of defense is your reactive stuff, your reactions, your immediate cards, some cases, even your hasty cards. You use these to prevent the opponent from getting past your first line of defense, or failing that, just prevent them from confronting at all. So. Once you've got them locked down, it, you still have to score points. So typically, most control decks will score points by uh, confronting a problem once every turn. Sometimes you might throw in some photo finishes, say Cassés, to score on the opponent's turn, or even some good old for, uh, good old fashioned beating up your own epics just to get a little bit point acceleration and close out the game before they can break out of your lock. That's really it. So to recap, since that was kind of a lot, you set up for a couple of turns while letting the aggro player do what the aggro player is going to do, then crack down hard, close that iron fist, don't let them escape, and score some points in the process. Simple as that, really. So that's control. How would you go about beating aggro as a farming player, Grand Boss? So farming is interesting, because farming's win condition is pretty much in direct opposition to aggro's win condition. Farming almost never cares about confronting problems, uh, even less so than control decks. Perhaps only combo cares less than this. Uh, and aggro, of course, wins almost entirely by confronting problems. Farming is going to be running a ton of troublemakers, which just in and of themselves, because they are troublemakers, stop aggro from being able to do their thing. The timing on when your troublemakers flip as a farming deck can be very, very important. In addition, when you're playing your troublemakers and how many of them you're playing can be equally important. You have the ability to queue up multiple troublemakers at a problem, or more specifically at a problem deck, which can be very, very good. This can protect against back-to-back -back problem face-offs. So, for example, if your opponent is running a blue deck and has a lot of movement chaining, they might have the ability to trigger a problem face-off, a multi-problem face-off on their turn, and then on their next turn get another one. If you have a troublemaker that's flipped face-up in the meantime, even at a new problem, that's going to make that much harder to do. Apart from just using your troublemakers efficiently, you want to try to gain a lead in power, especially if you're using a main character like Applejack, who has the ability to get stronger over time, eventually to a point where Nightlighter overpowering just isn't going to matter. Or you want to try to leverage uh, your higher flip average and more or additional flips compared to what the aggro player has. Uh, this can reduce the power of Nightlighter overpowering as well. The cool thing about farming is that just like aggro, both of these decks have the potential for very, very rapid point acceleration. Just because 
the Applejack mono orange villain farming deck isn't running a lot of cheap cards or a lot of cheap friends doesn't mean it can't close out the game in just a few select turns if it gets a good draw. So in that regard, it's really about knowing which troublemakers to play, uh, when and where you're going to play them, how you queue them up, and then trying to not let the aggro player catch up once you can get yourself a good foothold. Now that we've talked about how each archetype is typically going to play against aggro, it's a good idea to look mm -hmm. at the different colors that exist in the game and specific tools that each of those colors might have. We're not going to be limiting these to each color needs to play a particular archetype, but we do want to look at some general cards that may see play in a variety of different decks, starting, of course, with blue. So, Aura, what kind of tools does blue have access to? Well, let's see. To start off with, we've got a good old classic in blue, which is Rutherford. Everyone loves Rutherford, or hates Rutherford, or both. It's just Rutherford. He scares everything. Also, he's hasty, so he's even better at scaring everything. Obviously, if you scare their stuff during the score phase, they probably can't do anything about it, so, you know, there goes that confront. Confront phase not perfect. Yak smash! Yak smash! <laughs> uh, Ever Vigilant, of course, can help you get a bunch of friends or characters up to the problem during potentially even an opponent's score phase to swing the balance of a face-off to make sure that you win it rather than them. On the topic of going faster, as I mentioned earlier, Night Glider, of course, is a great pony for this one, who doesn't love getting two points just for winning. And finally, we're going to go with a rather strange addition to a blue deck, and especially an aggro deck, which is Twilight Sparkle zeroed out. Uh, where you drop a troublemaker into play and go, no, you're not confronting that problem this turn. Well, right. So blue has... You would use that in a control deck. You'd also use it in a control deck, but as I said, some of the best aggro decks will run control tools. This is true. We have seen several uh, decks that are running Zap for Chaos or other various pieces. But enough about blue. Uh, let's go over to Grand Paws, who will talk a bit about orange. Ah, uh, orange. So many options. And there are, of course, a few classics here as well. Uh, the biggest one, probably Popping Corn. This is a tremendous denial towards confronting problems. Uh, being able to exhaust an opponent's entire line of characters at a problem, including their main character, can be utterly devastating, especially if they are relying on either trying to trigger a problem face-off or needing to confront with rarity truly outrageous. You can also use cards like Carboloader, which most orange farming decks are going to use to get those extra flips in face-offs. Even if you can't necessarily win the face-off against an overwhelming swarm from your opponent, if you can at least make it closer, you can make it less likely that they'll be able to use the point acceleration provided by Night Glider Overpowering. And speaking of rarity and Night Glider Overpowering, as well as a lot of movement chaining friends, shutting off their abilities uh, with a card like Iron Will works very, very well. Iron Will is not only AT efficient, which Orange loves, but he's going to completely blank out opposing friends at his problem as far as what their abilities are going to do. So even trying to move something up there with Night Glider with efficiency is not going to end up working. As for multicolor cards, one of my favorite tools to use in kind of a non-intuitive way is Applejack's hat from High Magic which you are able to play on any character, including your opponents, and at immediate speed, exhaust that character and put a plus one power counter on it to add that character's power to your own. This can be very, very funny, especially when combined with a lot of the competitive friends that, Orn that Blue loves to use, or it can simply be used to deny a problem confront, just like Popping Corn would. The hat's a vampire! A vampire, I tell you! Night Glider loves wearing hats. Night Clider does love wearing hats. Almost as much as Cloud Chaser. <laughs> Speaking of Cloud Chaser and Flitter, of course, let's move to Pink. Bugle, what are we talking about? Well, Pink Pink has no shortage of tools for dealing with aggro. I mean, it likes playing aggro, but it likes beating aggro as well. So probably probably the first thing that comes to mind in most people's case, I think would be the good old-fashioned yoink. It stops Night Glider's cold, stops anything with competitive, really, and any, anything you can use to slow their, slow their AT, or their point gain while using no AT at all, pretty solid play, and yoink is just the embodiment of that. 
especially considering how popular Night Glider is. You can right do now. it with conductors, baton friends too. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, it doesn't have to be anything. Anything that makes them have more power than cost. Our Simpson Snails was very, very popular in aggro decks, and yeah, you can yoink them too. Lots, lots, and lots of targets. But there are other other methods too. It's not just just a dismissal. You've got stuff like like e even older than yoink. We've got Bell Tower. Flipping those troublemakers immediately. This is good for both control decks and farming decks because your chances are you're going to be running some troublemakers, and chances are they're not always going to be up immediately. When you play a troublemaker, it's not going to be face up right away. But with Bell Tower, you can have that troublemaker blocking the opponent. They can't do a thing, and they're going to have to probably. You know, they won't be able to challenge it if they had no characters there. So they're going to take some time. And time is not something aggro has a lot of. So Bell Tower, great, great answer against aggro. Then, of course, we've got Eccentric. In the Equestrian Odysseys block, we've got tons of Eccentric cards. Like, say, oh, I don't know, Sonata Dusk? You know, what? So she, That's not a card. What one costs? Yes, yes. Sirens are cards. Sirens are ponies. And two eccentric for one cost. And even if they can get past that eccentric by playing more friends to a problem than they ever want to, aggro is all about getting to a problem with as few friends as possible, and now you're making that harder. And Sonata says, oh, you're matching this exactly? Uh, I'm going to borrow that friend, and now you're not. Or maybe in the middle of a face-off, you're going to take their night glider and score those points instead. You know, like you do. Sure. And and of course, we 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 did talk about single target removal, but it wouldn't be we couldn't talk about pink without talking about mass removal and nothing. Nothing says mass removal like crazy pink Amina Diane Pie herself and the party of one. You have a friend they have no friends. Nothing shuts down aggro like saying they have no friends. And also, you can kind of rub that in their face a little bit, I Especially guess. Especially if they're running Princess Luna. Aha, uh -huh, you have no uh -huh. friends. <laughs> Poor Luna. Poor Luna. Anyway, I, I think Pink has tons of tools, tons more, but let's move on to Purple. Jeez? So purple is is well known for making aggro angry. No. Yeah. Yeah. One of the <laughs> never. I don't know. Orange might like a word about that. Oh, uh, you, you can have multiple famous colors. Wait, can we do orange and purple making orange, aggro purple angry at the deck. same time? That's not a thing. Yeah. A really great one. Nap cakes. Just put them to sleep. Oh, on top of the deck. Oh, and then flip that too. Why don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or that zero, or that one. So, opponent goes up to confront, bam, nap cakes. Another interesting thing, there's actually a lot of interesting plays you can do with nap cakes. Some of it is like, oh, they played a cloud chaser, well, nap cakes it. It's like you just paid two for nothing. One thing you do have to watch out for, though, is it is an immediate speed, but if they're going in, into a face-off, you gotta use nap cakes on the competitive friends before the face-off starts. Otherwise, they're, they're gonna gain their power and they're no longer gonna be targetable. Mm-hmm. Especially with Night Glider overpowering, that's important. There yes. is a cool trick where you can actually allow Night Glider to confront her problem, which would normally trigger a face-off, and before the face-off starts, then Nap takes that Night Glider to force the face-off and cause them to flip it. Yep. Another, another great one, Cutie Pox Scare. Just, oh, you're going to confront that? Nope. Go away. Or you're, you're setting up to confront my Troublemaker? Nope. Go away. Just everything is gone. And as long as you don't care about having your friends there, it's generally better for you. Now, if your opponent does happen to start the face-off, but you don't actually want it to finish, because you're going to lose, or just because you don't want the problems to reset, or for whatever reason, there's always cheerily. Just, uh, I didn't really like that face-off. Or you flip the card. It's like, yeah, yeah, no, we're not going to finish that. Another great one is Zipper Will, Poppy Addict. We actually saw a pretty great showing of her at Everfree Northwest. And combined with some other cards with either immediate speed or, or main phase speed, it's your opponent's about to do something, 
It's like, nope, move away. Purple is all about just nope. Mother, may nope. I? Nope. Nope. But? Nope. Yes. We, we have learned from Twilight that the meaning of friendship is no. <laughs> Indeed. And with that, let's head over to White, back to uh, Grandpa's. So White, very much like Pink, uh, has a number of options for uh, hard removal and disrupting tools to shut down aggro. One of the newest ones that we've gotten from Equestrian Odysseys, which has seen a tremendous amount of play, is Cold Wave. Uh, Cold Wave, for the low cost of two action tokens, will exhaust all characters involved in the face-off who do not have an attached accessory. Wear your hats. This is, hats are for protection. This, this is proof. Typically, most aggro decks are not going to be wasting spots on resources trying to get hats onto their friends. They're just going to play friends, because that's just more efficient most of the time, and you don't get two for one. So as a result, Cold Wave basically says this is a face-off speed, or rather an immediate speed that takes effect during a face-off popping corn that's better. It's a very, very good tool. Um, we ain't got time for all those hats. We're too busy going fast. They slow us down. That's right. Hats are not aerodynamic. Wing actuate or limb actuators are, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> uh, photo op is another classic white control card to deal with aggro. Most aggro decks are going to like moving in some regard. At the very least, they might want to move their RTOs back home. And photo op says no. Photo op says at the start of your main phase, or at the start of an opponent's main phase, you play this card and that player can't move their characters for the rest of the turn. So you say you can't move your friends up to this problem. Problem, uh, no matter how you move them, whether you want to pay, whether you want to try to conga line, whether you want to try to use an event that'll do it, doesn't work. In addition... Yeah, lots of tempo out there. Yes. Lots of tempo. In addition, they cannot send existing characters like RTO, or they cannot move them back home. So even if they are already confronting, being able to play a photo op at the start of your opponent's main phase will prevent RTO from being able to use her point acceleration tool. And that's really, really devastating, and not something that a lot of players are immediately catch on to. This is still a card that could potentially see play in control decks now. Yeah, and it affects, well, not, not just control decks, aggro decks usually mm, too, that's true. just to slow down the other aggro deck. But yeah, it stops RTOs in hand, too. They want to play that RTO and move it home? Nope, doesn't work. And of course, there's the, the universal tool, or the tool for shutting down universally anything, and that's Octavia Harsh Judge. This is an interesting card that gains more power the better you are at reading your opponent's deck and the meta and predicting what is going to happen. So, and, and their hand. hand, of course. <laughs> if you can get hand knowledge, this is even better. But if you can at least make a smart prediction as to what kind of cards your opponent might really want to play or what kind of key pieces might really give them the edge, and you play a Harsh Judge naming that, you can shut them down cold. So basically, go back and look at all the list of those things that Agra likes to play. Consider naming those. Yeah, those are good cards. Nightglide or Overpowering? You might want to name that. Rare or Truly Outrageous? You'd probably name that. It'd be a real shame if some meddling musician decided you couldn't play those. Or maybe you could name their Octavia Harsh Judges, so they can't interfere with your plan. This is very true. And speaking of limb actuators, this is another fun tool that we got, kind of in the same vein as wanting to just outrace your opponent, uh, similar to playing Night Glider against Night Glider, uh, you can play a Cybernetic Limb Actuator even during a face-off your opponent has started. You can play it anytime you've got priority. So being able to move one of your powerhouse characters from anywhere else up to a problem where a face-off is occurring, giving you an extra three power in the process, triggering on move effects, all of this can be great. You can do some really silly things here, including, and I'm not sure why you would ever do this, but if you, for example, had an Iron Will and you were playing a three-color blue, white, orange deck, you could move Iron Will up and shut down all your opponent's uh, abilities on all their friends at a problem. That's probably not going to happen, but I can dream. You think Iron Will's cybernetic limb would be a horn? It's got to be, right? It's, it's got to yeah. be a horn. Either that or it's a hoof. Robot horn. Go! Uh, so that'll cover white, pretty much. Of course, there's a number of hard removal options as well. A lot of dismissal and a lot of banishment effects. White has a lot of banishment, but there's just so many of those tools, we don't have time to talk about them all. What we do have time to talk about is yellow. Yellow? Who wants to talk about yellow? yellow? Oh, me? Okay. It was supposed <laughs> to be a hello pun. Probably 
the first thing that comes into most people's minds when playing yellow to beat aggro? Probably Critter Cavalry. They want to win face-offs? Critter Cavalry says, no, they are not allowed to win that face-off. You are going to steal that face-off for you. Whether you are playing aggro yourself or whether you're playing control, great card, one of the best face-off tricks in the game from Premier, still fantastic. Another really great yellow tool is Calming. With the new rules, Calming has gotten better since people are going to be trying to start face-offs more frequently. And, you know, Calming just makes that that much harder since anything they play from hand will have less power. And who's nice and Calming? Why, the Smooze, everyone's favorite chum. Not only is he Calming, but like we talked about before in pink, he has a Centric as well. So they're going to have a real hard time trying to confront any problem the Smooze is at. Another very valid strategy is just being bigger than them and... How do you do that with yellow? Well, you make a lot of small things, and then you make them bigger with stuff like Conductor's Baton. The more efficient your guys are, the better you can be at outracing aggro. So, yeah. And yellow is well known for its swarms, especially with Marks in Time and plenty of ways to get critters for free. So, Conductor's Baton. Think about it if you're trying to be aggro with yellow. and. As per usual, we've got a multicolor card for all of you guys. This is a fan favorite. She hasn't seen terribly much play, but she's still really good at this. Applejack, protective big sis. Not only does she give you an extra flip, but she means uh, she makes it so that the opponent cannot mess with this face-off. Period. And that is huge. So yeah. I'd, I'd say yellow's got some reasonable tools. So that's every color, but not every type of card. What about colorless cards, Arcat? How do they handle aggro? Well, so we've got a couple of obvious classics here. These are actually pretty old for the most case. Flim and Flam, the colorless friend, which is a card that basically says you may only confront one problem a turn. Uh, it's kind of hard to cause double problem face-offs or fracases or whatever we're calling those things now if you can't confront more than one problem a turn. So yeah, good luck uh, initiating face-offs under favorable conditions. It would be a real shame if you just couldn't use those dilemmas to start huge face-offs. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So that's a darn shame. shame. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Some other fun things here. Equal is Propaganda, a problem out of high magic that has probably been the bane of most aggro players in the first place. You can't score more than three points a turn. That great uh, would be would have been 11-point turnaround. Yeah, yeah. Should have paid more attention to the abilities on the problem. Is three less than 11? I'm pretty sure that three is less than 11. Cheese, can we get confirmation on that? Uh, I can confirm. Three is indeed less than 11. Well, three is less than 11. So Okay. Uh, there you go. Yeah, you're going to be scoring three points instead of 11. Good luck. Let's see. Last but not least, our by far most numerous category, literally any good troublemaker. Emphasis on good, because if you're going to drop a Pony of Shadows or a Timberwolf, well... New Sombra. New, well... Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about that. Windigo. But, yeah. Yes, Wendigo is a great example of this because an aggro deck will probably have a hard time developing enough power to actually challenge this while simultaneously keeping few enough characters there to actually initiate the challenge. There's a handful of other things as well. Like anything with the word villain on yeah, it? Yeah, anything with the word villain on it. What? Or zero bonus. Or zero or, bonus. Or, or yeah, power Let's just go down the list, system. really. There's lots of troublemakers. Yes. Lots, Lots and lots of troublemakers. Look into them, kids. They're great. May I recommend the good old-fashioned yellow paraspray? A game winner even after seven sets. Two of them at the start of the game. Good luck. You know, I haven't heard anyone call for that card to be banned recently. I almost missed those days. Hmm. People used to want that banned? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yes. absolutely. Along with Flutter Guy. Oh, yeah, but, but she did get banned. Yeah, she did. Wow. They got half of it. 
Well, that covers just about all the colors and the tips and tricks and tools that you need to be successful or have greater chances of winning against aggro. Uh, there is a lot of information that we've covered here, and hopefully you're able to put some of it to good use no matter what kind of deck you're playing. In fact, if this podcast did end up helping you, if you managed to take some of these tips into account or add some of these tools to your deck and you had good success with it, send us an email, commentaryismagicteam at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your stories. We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, and they may even be featured on an upcoming podcast. Additionally, if you like this style of content and would like to see more, we are always excited to produce that for you, but there are costs that are associated with this. So donating to us through our PayPal definitely helps keep this content new and coming. Even if you have uh, good, good stories against aggro, even if you didn't need these tips, like something that happened in the past, go ahead and send those to us as well. Yeah, any, any helpful, useful trick against aggro, we're, we're glad to hear it. With that, I think we're going to wrap things up for this first podcast. We'll be back here very soon featuring our next archetype, which I believe is going to be how to play against combo. So that should be... No one wants to know how to do that. No. Yay, combo. Yay, combo. We might... I, I'm not sure. We may have a few people here who know how to play combo. I, I, think, I think we can skip that podcast. Uh, here, here is how you play against combo. Do nothing, lose, and... That, that's roll, it. Yeah. roll over and die. Yeah, good advice. Just all <laughs> no, assault. no. Yeah, we 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 will have some legitimate tips for you guys next time. So yeah, I think I think we're done here for today. Well, thank you for joining us for our podcast. We are as always very glad to be able to keep producing this content for you. And as always, I am Grandpa's. I am Emperor Bugle. Big Cheese and Aracat. And we will see you all soon.